Welcome to the fifth Amazing Race Canada recap episode of the UR Team Number Podcast. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is the Canadian who would rather decorate a cake than do any task in Amazing Race Canada, Logan Saunders. Evening. You can, as always, tweet us using the hashtag Yattencast or email us at yattencast at gmail.com. So what did you think of this episode? This is what we call a logistical mess. A hot mess is a great way to describe it. It was one of... Simultaneously, one of the best and worst episodes I've ever seen. Yeah, I'm, that's pretty much how I'm feeling. It was so awesome to see so many things go horribly wrong for a production. This is a classic case of just not quite thinking everything through that you're doing for the round. A, a case study, if you will. There's really never been... There's, I, there's a couple of unprecedented things that happen in the episode. And a Canadian original that they didn't call a Canadian an original because, correctly, they probably guessed that I would have torn them a new one if they had. Yeah, because production does pay attention to us now for some reason. Yeah. Uh, and they did, in the preseason materials, describe the double battle, not face-off, as a Canadian original, to which the internet basically went, uh, hell no, try again. It is not a Canadian original. It originated in Latino America, and then it was more popularised by Israel. Yeah, we're we're essentially like the amazing race lobbyists, if you will. We're not you don't directly see us in the fray, but you know, we we've got the we've got the power. We're always we've there. The power. Yes. Watching. Waiting. Anticipating. <laughs> so previously teams flew back home and landed in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where some teams dived for success at the detour while others scraped the bottom of the barrel. Hamilton revealed his transgender secret to Brent and Sean and gave them the express pass. In and leg- to three million Canadians. Yep, exactly. And in a leg run in honour of her parents, Dijon and Leilani won it, whilst Hamilton and Michaela lost his passport and were eliminated from the race. And teams must now fly to the Ile de la Madeleine, to quote Sabrina. Once there, they must find the central console of their product placement car and find their next clue. And they have one loony, not a spoony on their card for the next leg of the race. They weren't they weren't allowed to use Natalie Spooner from last season as the currency for this leg of the race? No. I was very disappointed that the uh, the unofficial Canadian currency that we tried to popularise last year, the Spoonie, a three dollar coin, wasn't used here. It's a perfect opportunity. Yeah, opportunity wasted. Phil Kogan would be pissed. Especially with uh, Dana and Amanda out of the race. Yeah, I mean we were you know, after Dean and the Man is elimination, the country really needed to be uplifted, given some sort of hope that there's still some good in this world. And, of course, John climbed the bridge to uh, introduce Halifax. Yeah, because that's, I mean, what else? What, is he gonna, what else is he going to do in Halifax? Is he going to find a new book in the in a library and just, in a hushed voice, tell us uh, tell us uh, some fun stuff about Halifax before the start of the link. It would have been quite a fun intro if he had have done it in the library, and the, the librarian would have just tapped him on the shoulder and gone, shh! Yeah, they could have used, they definitely could have used uh, Asa Ketchum, who has the closest real name I've ever heard to Ash Ketchum from Pokemon. She's, did we talk about her last week, the Scarf Lady? We talked about her as the Scarf Lady, we didn't know that that was her name. Yeah, her real name, if you look on the Amazing Race Canada page, because I, I, I copied and pasted that one post into my complaints blog, her real name is Asa Kachin, and I made a joke uh, in my blog about how she's the closest I've heard in real life to having the real name of Ash Kachin, who of course is the protagonist in, po- in Pokemon. I think you'll have some very fun complaints. I love your complaints blog. I'm not just saying that, I do love your complaints blog. So does Mike Bickerton. He actually, he liked a couple of my Facebook posts on the Amazing Race Canada official page detailing about the complaints blog. Yeah, I I was having a quick look through the complaints yesterday on the Facebook page, as you well know, and there's some great ones already. Oh, it's going to be amazing this week. In fact, on Twitter, I think Mike Bickerton is starting to embrace the hilarity of the complaints that he, even though he rarely tweets about the Amazing Race during the course of the season. And one of his tweets, original tweets, was, uh, which was during uh, last night's episode, he said, there sure are a lot of armchair Amazing Race Canada contestants out there. <laughs> it's the first time I've heard a producer just openly diss casual fans on social media. Well, he's always come across as being a legend, Mike Wickerson, so it doesn't surprise me. 
he did favourite one of my tweets about hooking your brother up to um, to be the greeter on a, a UK lag in the future. Yes, that has to happen. Yes, it does. I wouldn't be able to tell you until the race aired, but, you know, that'd be hilarious. What we really need to see more of is Sean face-palming himself with the Express Pass like we saw in the previously on segment uh, today. Yeah, when you suggested that as a banner, I did go back and watch last week's episode, or the bit with the Express Pass, and he didn't actually do it in the episode. It was only this week. Yeah, because that's what I was thinking, too. I, I, when I was watching the previously on segment... I was trying to recall if I would miss an epic face, an epic face palm like that, but uh, no, we didn't. We, but luckily, I caught it this week, and editors did insert it into the episode, and we were treated to an express pass face palm, an express palm. And Sabrina did the sponsorship this week. You know, I love keeping an eye on who's doing the terrible sponsorship. So BMO does have her back, which is pr- which I guess is appropriate considering. BMO is based out of Quebec, and if Nick and Sabrina are from Quebec, then yeah, I, I think BMO would take care of its citizens. Exactly. And once in Quebec, teams have to pack their truck with everything they'll need for the leg before they can continue onto the next clue at Plage de la Sun du Sud. Caution, W turn ahead. You know what's wonderful whenever they do a Quebec round is that John Montgomery has to try and pull off a, fr- a French-Canadian accent which he fails pretty miserably at. Yeah, Monty's a trier. He, he's a he's a trier. He's a trier. Not a town crier like the greeter with them in Halifax, but a trier. He certainly throws himself into everything that he does. And we get a huge telltale sign very early on the episode that seeming Opie will finish last because they get a confessional for the first time in four weeks. Also, can I put out a a plea to John John Monty's robe on Twitter? Please stop trying to get me and him to face off in Skeleton, because I know Monty will be up for that. <laughs> no, it's not happening. I am not chucking myself down an icy hill. So do you think Neil and Kristen are edgy or squirrely uh, this week? Definitely edgy. Definitely edgy. Because it was Brian who had more, of, more trouble with his nuts when he was in the sand. One of my favourite... Uh, exchanges of the entire episode was just Brian in that hole, starting shoveling sand on himself, and then uh, she starts shoveling it, and gets it entirely on his crotch in three shots, and he's just like, nope, no, don't do that. No, seriously. I know <laughs> we don't got- start here. Um, work your way around. <laughs> yeah, I know we've not got kids, but I kind of like the boys. Exact quote from Brian. I know we don't have kids, and I've had a double vasectomy, but this is, you know, this is... Uh, <laughs> This is not what what I thought about when signing up for the Amazing Race Canada. Did you also notice that the judge in this task told them to go find new roads? Oh, for when they put the cars together before the roadblock? They had to put all the camp gear and that Brian and Cynthia are meticulous and that it's right up Neil and Kristen's alley, so of course those two teams that are supporting the, spo- the Chevrolet sponsorship uh, complete it right away because of how convenient and easy it is. Oh, yeah, he said, yeah, go find new roads, and then he must have been a Chevrolet employee, or maybe he just, you know, they just paid him so much to say it, and he just sort of felt a little bit embarrassed, and then he went home after having to say the slogan so many times, and he's like, well, you know, anything to put foot on the table for my uh, Magdalene family, and he wept for a good 20 minutes, because he, he knew he sold himself out. Like, all of his local credibility is gone, because now he's ultimately working for the man, which is Chevrolet, just forking over as much money as possible to uh, various people who need it to make more money. Also, did you notice that uh, there were some red herring items that they had to put on the truck? Like, I saw some rubber rings and some, like, pool toys in there. Oh, just like a rubber ducky and just the most random crap they could come up with to put into their vehicles? Yeah, there was like pool inflatables and that sort of thing that they just chucked in there for fun. <laughs> Sorry, when I hear inflatables, my, my mind went elsewhere. But uh, it would have been, <laughs> they should have thrown in just items that really have nothing to do with the Amazing Race or think, or be like the Israeli version of the Amazing Race and throw in items into their camping gear. That suggests that they're going to do awfully dreadful and terrible things, but then they don't even have to use them. Like, they should have had, 
oh, like a like a taser in there. If they threw a taser into the camp here and bear spray. To be fair, Amazing Race Israel, Hammer Out Slow Million, did go one further than the roadblock this week. They did entirely bury one person from each uh, team in Saturn for half an hour. Oh, right, with the Mafia task in Las Vegas. They did do that. Yes, they uh, they buried them in a coffin alive for half an hour for fun. Because, as we previously stated, Hammer Out Slow Million is basically run by psychopaths. And geniuses. And genius, yeah. We we love following Hammer Out Slow Million. Obviously, neither of us speak Hebrew, but we love following it because they are clinically insane. And I had to try and explain this to my brother a couple of weeks ago. You cannot understand how awesome the tests are in Amazing Race Israel purely because they are mental. There needs to be English subtitles for all the episodes, I have to add. If there was, we would probably cover it, let's be honest. Yes, I, I, I would for sure. I think we've tried to put out our, the challenge to our Hebrew-English listeners before. That very small subsection of our listeners. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All one of them occasionally. So once teams get to the plage, they have a roadblock, which is who is the king of the castle. And in this roadblock, one team member must recreate a sandcastle from an example. Atop their partner. To receive their next clue. And How did all the teams... Read the Roblox hint without pulling a Borat impression. I have no idea. I mean, I did know the Roblox hint this week. I didn't guess this task, and I do like a, a Roblox that involves torturing the other partner. Because it makes me mm-hmm. laugh. I'm and a horrible person. What they could have added is that while the person is being buried in the sand, that, the per- that, that individual has to do Borat impressions for the entire duration of the task. This is a way to motivate their partner to finish uh, finish the sandcastle construction. Also, one thing we did forget to mention, yet again, departure times. Yay! Yes, we did get departure times at the start of this leg. I know we're working a bit backwards, but we learned that, uh, what was it, first place team Dujan Leilani depart at 1.30 a.m. Yep. And extended all the way to uh, Nick and Sabrina, who were 4.14 a.m., so... That's close to three hours. Yeah, and that's there, reasonable. There actually wasn't that much between Gino and Jesse and Nick and Sabrina. There's only sort of half an hour, which you know would have blown the casuals' minds that Nick and Sabrina could get anywhere above eighth place. It makes you think that Hamilton and Michaela were probably like two hours behind after that. It wasn't even close. Not like the like before with the two-hour penalty being only two minutes off from eliminating Nick and Sabrina. Yes, thank you for reminding me that I was wrong with my suggestion there again, Logan. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm here for. We've not gotten to the pool yet this week. So, in the old roadblock task of who is the king of the castle, um, I wish Jesse was in the hole a lot more. Just throughout the season, like, in in life, he should be in the hole more frequently. Just, you know, like in the VHS uh, board game Nightmare, I would have paid Baron Samity to tell Jesse to hit the hole uh, much more often. Yeah, it was Gino, Cynthia, Neil, Simi, Matt, Dijon, Brent, and Sabrina doing the roadblock. And this was a great task for just out-of-context, inappropriate quotes. That almost applies to this whole round, I would say. Yeah, because we had Gino talking about always being in the hole as a child. We had another Sean puke. Yes, because Kristen said she could puke, and then it cut to Sean's second incident of vomiting on the Amazing Race Canada. He's still 15 uh, puke fits away from... Now, Natalie Spooner, but he's you know it's 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 a it's not a race it's a it's a marathon and Sean's going to pace himself out and I think he'll pull it off in the end. I must say, amazing editing there. There is nothing better about that scene than Kristen whining and saying, "Oh, I could puke," and then just immediately cutting to Sean <laughs> vomiting. <laughs> no break whatsoever. It was just like boom, bam. Thank you, vomiting ma'am. Just all, uh, it's all on the beach too. You know the vault. Well, what would make the scene just a little bit better is if Vulture swooped in and took care of the mess. Even funnier is the fact that Sean basically couldn't move his head, so he had to try and get it away from himself as much as is physically possible without destroying his brother's castle. <laughs> oh, class, classic case of sandcastle <laughs> being uh, collapsing due to human vomit. And uh, Sabrina says that she would rather decorate a cake. 
ra- a, a cake rather than a castle with around a six foot man. Nick is, I think, a couple of inches shorter than me, so I feel her pain with trying to to bury a six three person. I think John F. Kennedy would like to see a cake decorated with the uh, with a six foot three woman if uh, if that helps at all. Granted, I don't know what sing- what Sabrina's or Nick's singing ability would be like when popping out of the cake, but I'm sure it's wonderful. <laughs> I'm just imagining someone trying to jump out of a, uh, a cake made of sand now and just not being able to do it, <laughs> and just sort of having their head trapped. <laughs> just like, yeah, I'll be I'll be there to sing to you in a sec. I'm just trying to break out of this cake. And it would be a Dairy Queen cake. It's a masonry scandal, so, you know, Dairy Queen bought the rights to it being their cake. At an Acadian celebration. Yes. Acadian. Yeah, catered by uh, the final four teams. That was a terrible leg. Uh, yeah. Gino and Jesse are the first to leave the roadblock. There's Brian and Cynthia in second, Simeon Opie in third, Nick and Matt in fourth, Brian and John in fifth, Tijon and Leilani in sixth, Neil and Kristen leaving in seventh, and Nick and Sabrina in eighth. No coconuts were damaged, surprisingly, by Brian. He threatened to that he could break a coconut with the with his ass, but it it never happened. That 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 would have been a worthy scene to go on by. And uh, Neil and Kristen have a detour of their own, which is to the hospital to sort out her cramp. Oh man, that that's it was. I mean, there's so many unintentional comedic moments with that with that whole roadblock, especially with Neil saying, "Oh, finally have the upper hand on Kristen." On you know, nobody, no father ever has the upper hand on their daughter, and then he was complaining, "Oh, but she's still talking. She's just whining the whole time." And then you find out. Oh no, she's not really whining. It's just that she's lying on the beach next to uh, on a beach in the middle or late April or early May on an island in Quebec, which is not going to be too warm a water that early in the year. Only if you're in the Okanagan do you have a chance to swim in swim at the lake uh, in early May. So it's just hilarious that he was just loving every minute of it and probably taking about ten or fifteen minutes longer than he could just because he thought it was funny. And it comes at the great expense of Kristen having worse leg cramps than, or, body, or cramps all over her body that are worse than a certain contestant from the second season of Amazing Race Canada. Never go up, Shola. Yes, it was worse than the Charlie horse. It's now a, it's a Kristen horse. I I do like how we just dubbed it the Shelly horse. She'll never. It's be trending. Today. It's trending on Twitter. It's now it's now trending more than the no Netflix tax. She'll never be forgotten between the Charlie horse and the cute outfits. <laughs> and popsicle sticks. And popsicle sticks, although that was Nabila. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a good bio, I love that one. You know what would have been funnier though that could have happened during the roadblock? Because Nick and Sabrina are you know, they're gonna take like two more hours to finish this roadblock for whatever reason. Is that if Nick got so cold as well that when Sabrina was uh, stepping all over his arm, is that if Nick's body just solidifies to the point that when Sabrina steps on his arm, that it just snaps off of him. He would then be armless to the, to the other teams, though. They would get eaten. Oh, because... he would be an inspiration if he lost the one arm. He would be the new Bethany Hamilton. He could be like, I'm the most inspiring, amazing race contestant ever. Nick and Sabrina, you've joined <laughs> yes. our club. Yes, he can adopt a high-pitched voice. <laughs> a high pitched voice, or not so much a high pitched voice, but one with the really heavy inflection uh, when uttering a statement, no matter what what mood he's in. Come on, love, you can finish this roadblock. <laughs> I'm very glad we didn't have the love count this week because it was very high. It was about five in that task alone. Mm-hmm. And once teams complete the roadblock, with the exception of Neil and Kristen, they have to head to the Monument au Pêcheur to find their next clue. Caution! Double battle ahead! Yeah! So what What did you think of the the first appearance of the face-off slash double battle? Well, I appreciated the smiling referee uh, during the task. He was very happy about this face-off. Maybe because the town he's in is so small that uh, he's uh, he's probably been so alone and hasn't seen people outside of his village in five years that he's just eager to have new tourists come around and, and uh, visit him. Yeah, new friends. New friends to play with. Yeah. 
Like, uh, it's like uh, new toys, you know, new new action figures. He's basically a character from Toy Story. <laughs> You're my favorite Kaya Kaki deputy. And he's coming. So do you think with this face-off that production watched Survivor Gabon right before uh, filming this season? Because it's the exact same challenge where in Survivor Gabon, the two tribes really just have li- these circular boats, and they had to pass the ball back and forth between each other and score in the opposing net. And this task is very, very similar to that. Every producer should watch Survivor Gabon before making any season. I would love it if one of the greatest was just Crystal Cox looming over Muncie, just going, get you, go home, keep racing. Yeah, he sh- Yeah, we need Crystal Cox from Survivor Gabon to be a pit stop reader on every elimination leg where John Montgomery looks all sad. Or, oh no, he she should have been there for the Halifax pit stop where John Montgomery's like, Hamilton, Michaela, on behalf of all Canadians everywhere, thank you for being who you are. And then they all have this happy moment, and then Crystal just jumps in halfway through the hug and says, forget you guys, go home, <laughs> goodbye, take with your passport with you. You have made this race hell from day one. <laughs> Eat your lobster. Did you hear what Brian's nickname is for Cynthia? Chewy as in Chewbacca. <laughs> this was right after they finished the double battle. He said, oh, you know, uh, you know, watch it, Chewie, because he was criticizing her driving. So Maybe Chewie Gone's just his favorite Survivor tribe. Chewie Gone, yes, that's very possible. Hey, we saw, our, uh, we saw our Survivor buff on King of the Nerds UK this week. Stranger things have happened. I could see I could see a crossover happening between Survivor and Amazonary's Canada. What about Survivor Canada that's going to be in the Ile de la Madeleine? Oh, I've heard that. You know, every, I've heard four people are going to be medically evacuated for cramps. And it's not going to be Lindsay Richter. Yeah, it's going to be uh, worse conditions than Survivor Co. Wrong. Yeah. So, in this double battle, teams must compete against each other in the El de la Madeleine's favourite sports kayak hockey. The first team to score two goals wins the match and gets their next clue. And the losing team must wait for the next team to arrive. The last team standing will get a predetermined penalty. Unless, of course, everyone just quits. And we get a little East versus West conflict here. We do. And in a shocking turn of events, in a physical competition, do you know Jesse won? And Cynthia tips over, repeatedly. Sadly, it wasn't as funny as the log roll. You know, with Cynthia, you know, with the log roll and her crashing on her crotch a couple times during that roadblock, it's very fitting that this week that Brian's uh, crotch gets a bit of damage during the sand roadblock, so... Everything evens out. Yeah, at least the uh, the Cynthia damage wasn't inflated by Brian. Brian's damage was entirely inflated by Cynthia. Yes. They're really going out of their way to make sure they don't have any kids. Yeah. <laughs> so, as Logan said, it was Gino and Jesse versus Brian and Cynthia in the first match, which, shockingly, Gino and Jesse won. And then Brian and Cynthia took on Simi and Opie, and as I predicted, not mentioning anything, but, you know, a kick-ass, um... Brian and Cynthia beat Simi and Opie, as did Nick and Matt, as did Brent and Sean, and as did Dijon and Leilani, at which point Simi and Opie just throw in the towel and take a four-hour penalty. And then Neil and Kristen get there back from the hospital and realise that it's something physical, so there's no chance they'll be able to do it, so they take a penalty as well, leaving Nick and Sabrina to have no opponents, so they win automatically and get their next clue. That's a very, this is not what they were expecting for their first face-off, I'm sure. That was this is just so... So weird. I wonder if wonder if the thing they'll correct for future seasons is to have ta- a task that more people in general can complete or have it earlier in the leg before some of your teams are suffering for, from hypothermia. <laughs> to my knowledge, there has only been one team in Israeli history that's quit a double battle, and that was in the most recent season. So this is unprecedented. Yeah, two teams refusing to compete. And with Kristen, I think she... Didn't really need to use her legs at all, just her arms, but I guess at that point that it was still, she was still just released from the hospital, that her body really hadn't recovered at all as of yet. Also, she would have been facing Nick and Sabrina, who hate water. It wouldn't have been that difficult for him. She could have literally just treaded water and let Neil deal with it. What if it had just been wild to see Simi and Opie versus Nick and Sabrina in a water challenge? That's what I was waiting to see, because I expected that would be the final matchup, but <laughs> it, never, it never panned out. 
we missed we missed out on it like Fedor versus Randy Couture just just a you know a show, showdown that was never meant to be a missed opportunity. And once teams get their face off clue, they find out that it's a detour, which is ride it or pull it. And in ride it, teams must master the sport of dressage. Once they both complete a course in a combined time of less than eight minutes, they receive their next clue. And pull it requires teams to roll a 75 pound hay bale into a barn, and then they must milk a cow to fill a one litre bottle each to receive the clue. For Masoners Canada, which tries to promote itself as a family show a lot more than other versions of the Amazing Race, that we have a detour called Ride It or Pull It. And it's not even the most dirty thing said in the detour. No, not when you have Brian there talking about his genitals in his butt for half the time. And Brian also saying that he has never milked a bull. Pretty sure that is not safe for work, Brian. <laughs> Pretty sure that that would get heavily censored. What's even worse is that, like, and then write it in the uh, write it as well. That it was all about mounting as well with some of the language they used in there. They had to mount and, and navigate Isabel. I'm pretty sure that may or may not be illegal. And um, one thing I noticed when they were on the way to the horse detour that Jane and Jesse cannot pronounce French for the life of them, but Brian can. Yes, the guy who lives. In the middle of Manitoba, and just has the most Anglophone-ish surroundings, can pronounce, can speak French better than two guys who were well-educated and were originally born in Italy. Yeah, I love the fact that nobody seems to believe us that Gino is a geography major, and they were having so many directional fails. I mean, how do you how do you have a degree in geography and in human have geography? Just zero, as well. zero, yeah, and have just have zero sense of pronunciation of the French language. Yeah, when you live in Ontario as well, and Quebec's right next door, like in BC here, there's very few French speakers, so uh, it's always a lot more advantageous for us to learn, say, Punjabi or Mandarin or Japanese, even though most of us really don't bother to. But it's a lot more advantageous than. You know, somebody who lives in Ontario and and should be learning how to speak French to some degree. Yeah, and as we found out last year, there's only one bilingual province, to quote John Montgomery, which is New Brunswick. And Leilani went to horse camp in her summers, and Kristen grew up riding a question. Yeah, they're, they're both, they're both uh, horsing around, as we would say in Bojack Horseman. I'm surprised that the horse camp that the Sarah Jessica Parker was nowhere to be found. You, you think that will be worth a celebrity sighting uh, back in their chattel today? You know, there, there's there's uh, there's Carrie Bradshaw. The main attraction of the leg. Main, get it? Horse? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're pulling out all the stops. Oh, I am. You know what's a great thing about this detour that was, especially with the Ride It part of the detour, is that... They should have had Joyce from the Amazing Race 7 try to attempt uh, riding a horse again and try to redeem herself from her performance at the uh, leg four roadblock back in the Amazing Race 7. Not sure she'd ever return, but you know. So Gina and Jesse were the first to leave the detour, Gina and Paul, with Brian and Cynthia in second, and Brent and Sean in third. Uh, Dijon and Leilani left ride in fourth, with Nick and Matt leaving Paul in fifth. Uh, Neil and Kristen in 6th, Simi Nopi leaving Paul in 7th, and Nick and Sabrina in 8th. The stare at the point of mules uh, to, <laughs> to find the double U-turn. And for some reason, Brian and Cynthia decide not to U-turn Gino and Jesse, despite the fact they know they are first to the U-turn. What the hell, guys? They weren't thinking. They no. weren't thinking. Well, actually, well, what's uh, in all seriousness, though, they were thinking it's, it was the right move to do, but for for the sake of the audience... And for, for our sake here on Yattencast, very unpopular decision to not U-turn Gino and Jesse. The Bolden Mill and Mussolini's uh, were well overdue to be taken down a peg. To quote... By a Winnipeg couple, no less. A Winnipeg peg. To quote the great Katie Upton, you turn the shit out of them. Amazingary 16. Come on, bring them down a peg. Create a rivalry, make this season fun. I think what happened is that Brian was too focused on his generals and his butt at the roadblock, and then you have Cynthia to get on that tit when uh, <laughs> milking the, the cow that. there. 
that they just had so many, they were just distracted by all the bodily functions that uh, were so prevalent in the hours leading up to the W turn that they they weren't quite right, uh, right in race mode, they were more in racing mode. Yeah, I mean, I know that there's going to be another U turn and you're worried of Gino and Jesse doing a retaliatory one, but life's too short. Make it funny. Entertain me, despite the fact that for the first time all season I actually supported Gino and Jesse in their decision to U-turn. Because Gino and Jesse decide it'll be more fun to U-turn Brent and Sean to eliminate the Express Pass. Which doesn't work because there's three teams that are a kajillion hours behind, and Brent and Sean are smarter than that. Yeah, and and also, it was getting to the point in the episode where I was going, oh my god, I could be getting full points on the pool this week, I could actually, you know, have a chance. It's sort of what I predicted with the U-turn situation as well. As I said, I said in my blog that either Gino and Jesse are going to U-turn Brent and Sean or vice versa. I just thought that Brent and Sean would get the, the laugh there because I figured other teams would cover Brent and Sean by U-turning Gino and Jesse if they got there before them. But I think the reason why Gino and Jesse ultimately U-turned Brent and Sean had really nothing to do with the Express Pass. I think it had more to do with that in terms of backlash from the audience, that just you turning the other competitive team of brothers just would go over a lot better than, say, you turning a father-daughter team or or Nick and Matt, who are fan favorites, or you turning the older couple in, Brian and Cynthia, that I think that you turning Brent and Sean was probably the safest thing they could do anyway and be a friendly competition thing, and they didn't have to worry too much about any personal conflict with them as well, and Brent and Sean were going to U-turn them as well for pretty much the exact same reasons. But what the hell, guys, at Brent and Sean, you turning Nick and Sabrina? I think what happened there is that they just wanted to U-turn a weaker team, and it was either going to be U-turning Nick and Sabrina or Sini and Opie. That's pretty much what you see in a double U-turn, is that the stronger team gets U-turn, they decide, well... Uh, there's got to be at least one of these two weaker teams behind us, so let's just U-turn one of them and guarantee that we survive. If you knew that a particular team was had a four-hour penalty, of course you pile on them. You want them out of race. Don't care how nice they are. You don't go for Nick and Sabrina, who are, you know, awesome. And Nick and Sabrina find out that the horses are closed for the night, so they have to serve a penalty before they can get their clue. Did we ever find out how long that penalty was for not being able to do the ride at Detour? No, but I'm assuming it was probably between about half an hour and an hour, because it was out of their control. That's the difference. Here's a fun fact, casual fans. It's completely... If his stuff is out of Nick and Sabrina's control, they don't get a penalty for it, like the double battle. That's just how Amazing Race works. They can't penalise a team for other teams' mistakes. Nick and Sabrina got a predetermined penalty for not completing that side of the detour because they were unable to complete that side of the detour. Because of production's mistake. That's the that's my biggest complaint about this episode is that it's the first double U turn of the season and possibly the only double U turn of the season. And they have it at a detour that has where one of the options, the less popular one has limited hours of operation, so if a team gets U-turned and has to go do the other detour, chances are it's already going to be closed. Yeah, if we go back to Amazing Race 21, which is the last time this sort of thing happened, with Josh and Brent doing synchronised swimming task in Russia and the pool being closed, the whole reason they got a six-hour penalty and Nick and Sabrina didn't is because Josh and Brent could have switched detours. Mm Mm-hmm. Nick and Sabrina had no choice because they were U-turned, so they got a smaller penalty for it. That's how life works. Mm-hmm. That would, that's one of the rules, I think, that uh, were probably buried pretty deep in the rule book that producers, I bet you, that off-screen were scrambling to verify what happens if, if this occurred during this leg. That's just how it works in Amazing Race. If team has no choice but to complete that side of the detour and they can't, then they will get a smaller penalty than a team that doesn't complete a side of the detour that they can switch. It was probably this is probably one of the worst leg designs though in terms of just this being able to happen. It reminds me of the premiere of Amazing Race Asia Four where they had the underwater roadblock where if you didn't complete it within ten minutes on your first attempt, then you got a four hour penalty. So really all that happened is that whoever was able to complete that task 
was automatically in the top four or five teams for the leg, and then whoever didn't complete that task were essentially in a foot race to the pit stop. Oh, it was a complete and utter mess, this leg, but, you know, a glorious mess at that. I did, I did love at the double battle was, was just Zimi and Opie's banter between each other as well. That was pretty hilarious with Simi crying, and then Opie said, oh, don't cry, Simi, and then... And then she just said, I'm not tired. <laughs> not frustrated. <laughs> I am not tired. She's basically King Joffrey from uh, Game of Thrones. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, they kind of had to show Simi and Opie this week because they came in last. Yes. And the one swing that Opie takes during, I think it was the last double battle that they had, so it would have been against Dujon and Leilani, I guess, were their final opponents before quitting, was... Opie's frantic swing with the with the with the paddle that that just made me laugh so hard. <laughs> it's just that last desperate attempt before you see them intensely shivering and needing towels immediately just to warm up. Because I think if they were out there much longer and Opie had to jump in the water too many more times, I think they very well could have been going to the hospital as well. And once teams pass the U-turn. They head to the pit stop, which is Point, Old Harry, on Gross Eel. Gross Eel? Is that like in the Amazing Race 4 when they had the roadblock in the Netherlands and they had to handle the 20 slippery eels and put them into that one bin before they could uh, go to the pit stop? Which is apparently the English-speaking part of the Ile de la Madeleine. And the last team to check in here may be eliminated. Was the greeter Elias Elias's brother? The greeter was a fiddler. I thought he was playing a mandolin. A mandolin and Magdalene. Fiddler works better, because you know I can make all the dirty jokes then. I thought a fiddler applied to uh, whoever was involved in the Ride It or Pull It detour. <laughs> Ooh. And it was crazy just how ridiculous the amount of bodily function references were going on this leg, because during the roadblock as well, Nick was was said his bladder was full, and the only reason he couldn't go was because of all the sand on top of him. Yeah, they told me specifically when I went wakeboarding in March not to piss in the wetsuit, basically. I thought you'd go on the suit just like the astronauts. Of course, it takes you about five minutes to get out of it to go to the loo, but they told me specifically, please don't do that in the suits. And, of course, another great comment from Sabrina during the roadblock is that her and Nick can't expect miracles, but they essentially get a third miracle in a row. Which amuses me to no end. Well, out of the 45 minute running time, Nick and Sabrina were still at the roadblock at 35 minutes. She must have taken forever. That must have been hours behind everybody else because they couldn't even complete the other side of the detour and Kristen was already out of the hospital. They took her in an ambulance to the hospital and I'm guessing the hospital is not going to be uh, uh, too close to in the middle of the Magdalene Islands. And they were already released and already back on the race course. Also, whilst I think about it, how did uh, Neil and Kristen's car get to the hospital? Because they went from the uh, they went from the roadblock location in an ambulance, so the car would have been left there. That is a great point. Logistics. Yeah, I don't know how they managed to get a car. I'm sure they just somebody of like one of the members of the production crew probably drove it back and forth. Yeah, but production aren't usually allowed to do that sort of thing. Maybe in the case of a trip to the hospital when it's a medical emergency, they might have that loophole in there. Yeah, there must be a loophole in the rules because under my impression of the rules, production can't interfere with the race at all, basically. And that would be 100% interfering with the race. Yeah, that's a... Hmm. I wonder what they would do there. Because... on Because you think, well, if you can't drive this car, then you... Uh, can't really finish this leg. If, if Kristen can't feel her legs and she's supposed to drive, uh, maybe she's not well enough to continue on with the race. Bergen and Kurt, you get a penalty if you can't drive. And then finish 12 hours behind everybody else. But with Kristen too, I mean, besides the whole sports pep talk thing with her and her father at the detour there, I thought it was very fitting that after she got a massive case of, of Charlie horse at the roadblock, that she had to proceed to ride on a real horse at the very next task. And checking in first, ugh, was the Volder Mussolini's. The mad cow milking machine. No, you know it's a real reign of terror when the Volder Mussolini's are making mad cow uh, disease jokes. 
but more importantly, they get a terrible prize. <laughs> yeah, you get to fly elsewhere within Canada. Yeah. How yeah. lame is that? Given that this season already, we've seen Rio, we've seen India, we've seen the Caribbean, and then flying to Canada. You get an exotic trip to Winnipeg. Yay! Go over to Brian Cynthia's house. He can show you how to milk a bottle. <laughs> you get two two tickets worth up to a hundred dollars each. <laughs> Does breakfast in bed come with that? No, they don't even get breakfast in bed. It's literally just tickets and a year of petrol. But still, what the hell, guys? <laughs> And uh, Brian and Cynthia come in second, with Nick and Matt obviously in third for the fourth leg on the drop. Uh, Dijon and Leilani in fourth, Brent and Sean in fifth, and Neil and Kristen are sixth to arrive, with Simi and Opie in seventh, but both have a four-hour four penalty to serve. Is it just a rule that these two teams always have to arrive together at the pit stop? Have they always finished back-to-back places in all four episodes? No, actually, because Neil and Kristen won a leg, didn't they? Oh, yeah. Yes, they did. Leg four, yes. And leg five, yes. So with the past two legs, you're right. 40% right. Yeah. And sixth was Nick and Sabrina because of the penalties. Seventh was Neil and Kristen. And eighth was our dearly departed, Simi and Opie. Oh wait, it's a surprise keep on racing leg. They structured it like the final four non-elimination trick from the past two seasons of The Amazing Race US where we don't find out till the very end of the episode. In the final four non-elimination twist, they did at least show us, like, Laura and Tyler receiving their clue. We just didn't Mm -hmm. know that it was an actual non-elimination. Right. But, what the hell? I'm very happy that it was a non-elimination, especially with Simi and Opie, because, you know, all the points on the pool. Yes. But I'm pleasantly surprised that they tried this trick on us, and not actually confirming it was a that it was a keep on racing leg or a double end leg, as I would call it, until like the very end. I like that they did this. Rigged. <laughs> yeah, producer. Yeah, I bet you there's some people out there that are saying, "Oh yeah, producers waited until after Simi Nopi arrived uh, to say it was an elimination that was a keep on racing leg." So how did the? Uh, so that means all the other teams must have left after them with the clue. Well, the thing is, you can't always, even on a keep on racing leg now, you can't always assume that it's going to be an elimination because Latino America loves doing keep on racing legs that are eliminations. It has happened. I wish we would adopt that. Yeah, but as I was saying to you yesterday in my book, this is not a keep on racing leg, this is a double length leg because Monty said the words, this leg is not over yet. But officially it's a keep on racing leg because they don't do double lengths anymore for some reason. But I would call it a double length leg. This leg definitely deserved to be the first non-elimination leg of the season, though, simply because production screwed up quite a bit this round. And I have a very important question for you, Logan. How does it feel being last place on the pool? Last place in the prediction pool? I would have had those points if I just reversed Gino and Jesse with Brent and Sean in uh, the U-turn question, but I think I'll gain ground quickly. Yeah, I'm only going to gloat for this week because I will probably go back to being fourth again next week. But yeah, I on the predictions pool that we run every week, me, uh, Logan, Eamon and Michelle are all guessing in a power ranking style plus bonus questions, two of which are worth one point each. And from this week, we had guessing the non-eliminations. If we guess them correctly, we get an extra five points. And somehow I managed to fluke my way into getting every single point available this week which finally gave me a good enough week to overtake Logan in the predictions and put me three points off the lead now. What we really need in this leg, especially when teams are running up the stairs to the U-turn board, is that after running 185 stairs, they should have met uh, Canadian athlete legend uh, Matt Stairs at the top. I think that would have been fitting. Reference gone straight over my head. He's a famous baseball player. He's a Canadian baseball player from... Either Nova Scotia or New Brunswick. There are Canadian baseball players? Yes, there is. Larry Walker, you got Jason Bay here from BC as well. In fact, my dad worked with a guy who struck out Larry Walker, but his career went nowhere while Larry Walker became one of the most famous Canadian baseball players of all time. Of all time? Of all time, yeah. He was in the major leagues in the All-Star game numerous times, did a... 
an amusing John Crook impression during one of the other games, which is probably another reference that goes over your head. Yeah, this is just words. This is just this is just words. But to this to Canadian listeners out there, you know, Matt Stairs and Larry Walker and Jason Bay are all important people. And next time, we're going to Sudbury. Where? Sudbury, Ontario. Where the hell is that? Ontario. I've asked around. It is to do with mining. Mining? Or is David and Mary going to be there? Next week, I think they're going to the big nickel there they keep talking about in the previews, which is is appropriate because this week, Brian and Brent and Sean and the other contestants, while at the cow detour, got to play with the big nipple. So it's all thematic. And teams face meals of mealworms, Nick killing someone, synchronized swimming, and mining. That's so cruel that producers cast three teams that suck at water, and <laughs> and then they give them a bunch of water tasks from starts from the for the first six rounds of the race. I'm really looking forward to what looks like the roadblock with Nick, uh, Nick killing someone. <laughs> I just I think it's going to be a funny task. Watch out, see me. Grieving relatives. Simi does it as well. I've seen a picture of Simi doing it. So it's a, it's a big change from him sweet-talking cows in the French language. No, no, he's going to just be wiped. He's going to go on a rampage uh, archer style. Oh, but archer style? Yes, archer style. He's going to bring up some quotation about Regis Philbin and an old lady who wasn't able to watch who wants to be a millionaire. So, that is our leg. Yes, and unfortunately... It didn't end there, because there's a follow-up special with the social, <laughs> oh, no. which you got to miss, but yeah. I suffered through for five minutes. Yeah, I sort of love-hate relationship with the social is quite well documented. They are not the ladies from the social, they are the harpies from the social. <laughs> Logan, for some reason, put himself through watching a five-minute segment for the good of the podcast. Yes, so pretty much it was a trivia competition between the bright, the biggest Amazing Race fans at the social possible. And what's even crazier is that all the questions were just from the past four episodes of the season. So there's there's not a lot of material to study up on Wikipedia. Like, And plus they've seen it in the past month, so their memories should be fresh. And they divide them into t- two teams, each with two people, fittingly. And because you can't have a an amazing race challenge without a sponsorship involved. Uh, they have a rep from the from BMO sitting in the front row of the audience who, when called upon uh, after the contestant buzzes in and they need help, uh, she would just jump in and give them the correct answer and score the point for them. And out of the five possible questions, the people at the social still screwed up on two or three of them even after buzzing in. And there's this BMO rep, just off the top of her head, scored two points. So even though the end score was like four to one, it was really two to two to one because this BMO rep just did half the challenge herself. And it makes you wonder, why the hell are the people from the social being tied to the Amazing Race Canada? Even though it's CTV and it's Bell Media and all of that crap, they can find better people. They can find better people than The Social, better people than Devin Sultan Deke, and certainly better than James Duffy. I was going to say, why didn't James Duffy host this quiz? It seems like it'd be right up his alley. He would actually do decent at it, I think. So I, I would hope anybody that is watching a TV show for a month could, and has to, and is paid to talk about it, would be able to answer some questions about it. Like, one of them was fact or fiction... Because these are all true or false questions, essentially, but they call it fact or fiction to disguise the, diff- the easiness of it. Um, the one question was, true or false, is do teams check into a thing called a pit stop at the end of each leg? Yeah, James Duthie would ace any question on his specialist subject, which is shoulders of amazing races. Yes, he, or James Duthie is an expert on shoulders and those who cannot keep their shoulders intact. James Duthie is an also, also an ex- expert on everything about James Duthie. But what he's not an expert on is uh, being able to talk to Laura and Jackie properly. And being able to talk to Logan on Twitter. Yes. 
He doesn't have much of a sense of humor, that guy. I still laugh a lot at yours and James Dothy's spat. He, he hasn't he hasn't returned my calls. Still brings me immense joy. I baked him cookies. I baked him cookies. I used Sabrina's recipe and baked him cookies. Anything else to add about this like? Um, there was this one really weird moment where Brent and Sean vi- uh, finished the other side of the detour after they finished the horse, the ride at detour, and it said, "Oh, you know, currently in fifth place, Brent and Sean." But the camera operator couldn't keep up, so the shot is just of the ground, and Brent and Sean aren't in the shot for like three or four seconds. Well, we talked with Joe and Bill about unfit camera operators. Yes. The ones who couldn't keep up when we're out of shape. <laughs> oh, you've got our favourite camera crew. So, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back next week for another Amazing Race Canada recap episode of the URT Member Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, and even if you didn't, please subscribe to us on the iTunes and give us a like on the YouTube video. And if you want to see what we're rambling about this week, our Twitter handles are also in the descriptions of everything ever. Uh, and if you missed our interview with Mike and Rochelle from Amazing Race 26, that is also available on the iTunes feed which you can find links everywhere too. Thank you again. Seeming OP will be eliminated next week. And, of course, to add on top of that, uh, hashtag SupakuWacky, hashtag 250, hashtag Ginger Ninja, hashtag Yattencast. Peace! Peace out! Eight out! I can ride you like a carousel. <laughs>